special music this week is called One Day. It made me think of all those who waited for Messiah to come. Isaiah writing in his room, thinking of how one day God would send someone. And he was so specific about that someone. If you ever read Isaiah 53, you'll know exactly of whom he was speaking. But he was waiting all that time. And then he came. And now we are waiting for his return. Life can be challenging. It can be difficult. But we hold on to one thought, one day. So we hope you enjoyed the song. Thank you. 
Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I take it you're awake now. Yeah. Uh, this morning's reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. Now, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, Who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him, as he said to you. So they went up quickly, and they fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And when they heard he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. After that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked him and went into the country. And they went and told it to the rest. But they did not believe them either. So ends this morning's reading from God's holy word. Thank you, Tom. Good morning again, everyone. It's good to be together on this Easter Resurrection Sunday morning, 2023. There's five great events, five epic days in the course of human history on this planet. And they all correspond to the person and work of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was with his Father and the Holy Spirit on the surface of this planet when it was dark and void. And he spoke. And he spoke things into existence. All the beautiful creation that we see around us is the handiwork of Jesus Christ and God Almighty. That was the first epic moment. The second one was when Christ was born. God came off his throne, the person of Jesus Christ, and stepped into flesh and became a human child. He was destined to fulfill this call, asked for him by his father, that he would be the rescuer of men's souls. He had to be born in the flesh and die on a cross and raised from the dead, conquering all the bad stuff that keeps us up at night. The third great event was when he was crucified on the cross. He was born to die on a cruel Roman cross, let all his blood drain out into the dirt that our sins might be wiped clean. A lot of people and most of the world don't understand that, but the Bible makes it clear without a sacrifice, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. There had to be a sacrifice, and Christ stepped forward and did that for us at the cross. The fourth great event was when he rose from the dead, and that's what we're here about today, to worship, to lift up prayers, to lift up his word, and recount the story of Jesus Christ raising from the dead, conquering death, having that stone rolled away, by a massive angel, and Christ came to life and walked out. That was the fourth great epic event 
epic day on this planet. You know what number five is? The day he returns on a white stallion. And on his thigh will be written the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And he's going to come back and fulfill all the prophecy that was spoken. He will sit on the throne of David on Mount Zion. That's his mount, by the way. And the city of Jerusalem, that's his city, by the way. To redeem his people, bring them back together in glorification. We are his people if we believe in his name. And God called me to recount his stories. I was never very good at school, but I love stories. And Jesus called me, the son of a pastor, to stand up here on Easter 2023 and preach his word. And this week I was thinking, wow, what a privilege. What a privilege. It's become such a privilege and a joy to me. We're going to look at when Christ rose from the dead from the Gospel of Mark chapter 16. And as you're turning there, I'm going to lift up a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll help my tongue, help my mind, help my spirit to recount the beauty of your son's resurrection. What a privilege to know this. What a privilege to speak this. What a privilege to count on this for our salvation. I pray your spirit would stir our hearts to believe in this with all of our hearts, that we too might be saved. That's what Jesus said to the crowd. He said, I've come to seek and save the lost. If you're feeling lost today, you've come to the right place. If you feel lost today, step forward and believe on Jesus Christ, and he will make all things new. And we're grateful. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So on this early morning, on Sunday, the first day of the week, the ladies go to the tomb to anoint the body. Of course, as they're traveling there, they remember, well, who's going to move that big stone? It takes like at least two to three guys to roll that thing in place and roll it out of place. Probably weighed as much as a car. They were going there to anoint the body. These were ladies like Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, Salome. They were coming to anoint the body on the first day of the week. They had saw the cruelty that was visited upon Jesus Christ, their Savior. These women not only adored Jesus, but they were deeply in love with him. They saw the way he healed the blind, the lame, the leper, the demon-possessed. He was so cheered on the day he rode into Jerusalem. Last Sunday, we talked about Palm Sunday. He rode into Jerusalem on that little baby donkey, letting everyone know he wasn't here to conquer the Romans. He was here to go to the cross and conquer sin and death. And that baby donkey made that statement emphatic for everyone. So these ladies, they saw what they did to Christ. And, of course, they were there when the body was taken down and wrapped in linen cloth. They had to wipe off all the blood, sweat, and dirt and try to wrap it up as neatly as they could and put it into a tomb that was cut out of solid rock. And then the stone was rolled in place and everyone hurried back home for the Sabbath day to get ready. And they left Jesus there Friday night. He was in there all day Saturday until Sunday morning. So they're on their way, verse 4 it says, and when they looked up, they saw that the stone indeed had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side, and they were quite alarmed. <laughs> you got to love this morning. These ladies are heartbroken. And to their great surprise, the stone's been moved away, and they said, great, we can get in there and anoint the body of our precious Lord and Savior. And when they see the tomb open and the stone roll away and they walk inside and there's this man in white clothing sitting there speaking to them. And we find out that he is an angel. They saw a young man. He was a young looking angel. He was a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were quite alarmed by this, but I want to focus on verse 6. 
for really the rest of this sermon because he says something here that is really, really quite powerful, quite remarkable. In verse 6 it says, But he, the angel, this young angel dressed in white, said to them, Do not be alarmed. Do not be afraid. Do not be freaked out. Do not be anxious. He said to them, You seek Jesus, listen to these words, Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. So much good news in that single statement. Let's, let's take it apart for a minute. You seek Jesus of Nazareth. You seek that carpenter, Joseph's son, from Nazareth, that little nothing town. Is that who you came to find? This man born to Joseph and Mary, divine conception, born of the Spirit, the Scripture says, became mighty as a teacher and a prophet and a miracle worker, claimed to everybody that he was the Son of God, and that's why he got himself in so much trouble. And the Sadducees and the Pharisees stirred up all the leaders and all the priests and the Sanhedrin, which was the Supreme Court of Israel. And they were jealous and they were mad and they called him a blasphemer and they wanted him dead. They wanted him shut up. They were so jealous he was going into the towns and healing the lame and the blind and the oppressed. And people loved Jesus. They adored Jesus. They followed Jesus around. And he said that he was there to bring about his father's kingdom. But because of the jealousy of the Sanhedrin, the misconception of the people of Israel, and because of the cruelty of the Romans, this Jesus from Nazareth, this carpenter's son from Nazareth, he was dragged into Pilate's courtroom, questioned, and handed over to the Roman guard, and they proceeded to whip and beat the living daylights out of him, and then nail him to a wooden cross to hang there for six hours, suffocating to death. Wow, Pastor Troy, I don't know if this is what I wanted to hear on Easter Sunday. <laughs> that sounds like a bad day for Jesus. It was a bad day for Jesus, but guess what? I bring it up, because this is a good day for you and me. Because that blood forgives our greatest need, which is sin. And the resurrection solves our greatest need, which is death. He conquered sin, and he conquered death. And the angel says here, you seek this Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. See, this is what makes the resurrection so important. The crucifixion was Jesus' point. The resurrection was Jesus' purpose. The crucifixion and the resurrection go together. They're inseparable. He died for our sins and he rose from the dead to offer us eternal life. And so the angel says this, Jesus of Nazareth was crucified, he is risen, he is not here. A lot of people will ask, you know, why was Christ crucified? What is so important about this? This was predicted by all the prophets, preached by all the apostles. All the prophets and all the apostles gave their lives for this message. That says something. Would you give your life for a message, for a person? They did. That says something to us in 2023. These are men who gave their lives for the message of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ let his apostles know as they were going into Jerusalem that day for the Palm Sunday receiving as he was on the little pole and he was going to go to the cross a week later and die and then three days later raised from the dead. Jesus and the prophets predicted the whole thing and this whole thing came true. That's another reason we can believe it. A lot of people ask me, Troy, why should I believe that? Well, it was predicted and it came true 
And many men then and now give their lives for that story. Because they know in their hearts Jesus is real. Remember the Apostle Paul? He was a Pharisee. He was rounding up believers and persecuting them, whipping them, imprisoning them, and stoning them. Remember Stephen? Gave his life for the message of the cross and they stoned him in the dirt. And Paul was standing there. It says in the scripture, giving full approval. Paul was like the Pharisees who were so jealous wanting Christ to be crucified. And then what happened to Paul? He met Jesus. And see, that's what's got to happen with everybody. You've got to meet Jesus. And once you meet him and look into those eyes and hear his voice in your heart and know that you need the cross for you. And you have no other hope other than the resurrection. Jesus then steps into your heart, into your life, and opens your eyes. And you can see the truth of creation, which I mentioned. See the truth of the scripture, see the truth of the gospel, see the truth of Christ on the cross and in the grave. You can see it. The Bible calls it being born again. Jesus said, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, a lot of you know my story. I was a pastor's kid. Pastor's brat. <laughs> Grew up in the church. They always wanted me to sit on the front row, but I was sitting in the back row. I heard all the story, heard all the stories, but I didn't invite Jesus into my heart. That's the difference. A lot of us hear the stories, say, oh, they're great, we kind of believe them, we'll come to church once in a while, but I'm in control of my life. And we don't invite Jesus in. We don't see our need for forgiveness. We don't see our need for a new life. We don't see our need for a new purpose and a new hope. And I knew the stories. Then at 23, like Paul met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And Paul found out Jesus was for real. And this Pharisee who was jealous and, and persecuting the people turned his life over. And Jesus came in. And now Paul became one of the greatest apostles of all time and wrote most of the New Testament. And like Paul, 23, I met Jesus. And I thought, oh my. This carpenter from Nazareth, this Jesus, son of David, this Jesus that my dad preached for 50 years, this Jesus I heard about in the church for 15 years until I exited and left, this Jesus is real? Oh man, I need to believe. I need to repent. I need to change course. And that's what I did. And that's why I'm standing here. It's really quite amazing. You know, sometimes church can get boring and weird. I get it. You know? <laughs> it's like new people come on Easter Sunday. And they're like, wow, this is different. You know, people are singing with so much enthusiasm. What are they so enthused about? And this preacher is up here preaching out his heart about Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. What's up with Jesus? And, you know, i got to come on Easter Sunday because, you know, the family's going to be there. And my grandma's counting on it. You know? And then we all gather for Easter baskets and lunches and family time. What is it all about? You really won't get it, understand it, or give your heart to it until you know what Jesus is all about. And Jesus was crucified and rose from the dead. And when you know that he's a living Lord, you surrender your heart to him. You know, and I understand, you know, you exit the church. It's uncool, it's out of date, old songs, preaching, and everyone's dressed up. It's, I don't like it. And, you know, people are judgmental. Oh, man. The deacons, since I was a pastor's kid, picked on me constantly. <laughs> hey, aren't you Pastor Johnson? You can't be smoking behind the church. You can't be throwing snowballs at people's cars. Aren't you supposed to be in Sunday school? <laughs> you know what's funny about Jesus? He likes rebels outcast and nobodies. Amen. If you look at his story, the prophets and the apostles, they were all of that. 
He went outside the system to find people to serve him because the people in the system were all self-righteous and stuck up and ignoring Jesus and being evil. evil. Thank you. He had to go outside the church then, and he's got to go outside the church now. So if you're a rebel, an outsider, or feeling like a nobody, you would be great material for Jesus. Let me tell you. Okay? So Jesus had predicted that this would happen to him, and so he's with his apostles, his disciples, and they're on their way to Jerusalem. He's going to face the cross in one week. And these disciples, Peter, James, and John, blue-collar, fishermen, nobodies, uneducated, hated Rome. And they had a hard time understanding half of what Jesus said. So if you feel like that, join the club. Jesus says to them as they're walking in to Jerusalem. This is Mark 10, 32. Now, they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was going before them, and they were amazed. And as they followed, they were also afraid. And then he took the twelve aside, these future leaders, and began to tell them the things that would happen to them. Behold, we are going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man, that was one of Jesus' favorite terms of himself, because he relates to men, Son of Man will be betrayed into the chief priest, into the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles, the Romans, and they will mock him, they will scourge him, they will spit on him, they will kill him, they will crucify him, and on the third day, he will rise again. So Jesus tells the story to the disciples, and they didn't seem to get it. The reason I read that is to let you know what Jesus' purpose was, so when the women walk into the tomb that day, the angel reminds them of Jesus' purpose. Oh, you're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, the carpenter. Oh, the one that was crucified and so badly marred you couldn't even recognize him. That's what the prophet Isaiah said. When the Romans were done with him, the prophet Isaiah said he was not only not recognizable as Jesus, the person of Jesus, but he was not recognizable as a man. Why would Jesus put himself through that for you? What does the scripture say? By his stripes, Isaiah, by his stripes we are healed. All our transgressions and iniquity and wickedness was laid on him. That's why the cross, if you're mystified by the cross, well, I see the crucifixion hanging on my grandma's wall. And I see the cross out in front of this church. And this pastor seems to be really into it. What is this about? Jesus died on the cross for you. And bore your sin and penalty for you. That's why the cross is so amazing. Forgive your sin. The second thing that this angel said is, He is risen. He is not here. And I'm sure that when the lady stepped in, heard this angel, saw this angel, heard what was said, saw the missing body, they were amazed. Matter of fact, it says that they were amazed the very next verse. So they went out quickly, fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were so amazed. And they said nothing to anyone because they were so afraid. It was amazing to them that Jesus wasn't there. They were counting on it. You, you know that in the story because... They woke up early, they took spices, they were going to anoint the body, they were hoping someone would roll away the stone. So when they saw the stone move, they were surprised. When they heard the angel, they were surprised. When he said, he is risen, he is not here, they were surprised. And why was everyone so surprised when Jesus said that he was going to be handed over to the hands of evil men, be crucified, but on the third day raised from the dead? You know he said that three times in two weeks on the road to Jerusalem to the ladies who were always there following him, and to the disciples who were with him. He was predicting what was going to happen, but somehow they didn't get it, and they were all surprised. And so today we remember that he rose from the dead. It says here, see the place where they lay him? The next part, verse 7, but go and tell his disciples and 
Peter. <laughs> that is so interesting. <laughs> the angel says, he is risen. He is not here. The, the women are like, wow, wow. What? And as you go, tell all the disciples, and it's so funny, you know, angels and God has a sense of humor. Angel got the message from the throne, sitting there, giving it to the women coming into the tomb early that morning. The sun was just coming up. He says, go back and tell the disciples, he is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Remember, he said this. And tell Peter. Oh, everyone knew what that meant. Peter, the blockhead. Peter, the guy who doesn't get it. Peter missing his cues, saying the wrong thing. We remember what happened to Peter that night that Jesus was betrayed by Judas. And the group came with clubs and knives and torches and took Jesus away from these horrible midnight trials in the courtyard of Caiaphas, the head priest, and Pilate's courtroom before the Romans. And that night, Peter denied Christ three times as he was following Jesus in the crowd with the torches. They wait as they made their way to Caiaphas' court, as they made their way to Pilate's court. And in Caiaphas' court, he kind of snuck in. I want to see what they're doing to my Lord, my Savior. And there was people there saying, hey, aren't you with Jesus? Aren't you a Galilean? No! No, I don't know him. What was happening? Peter was scared to associate with Jesus. And a second time, yeah, you're a Galilean. You got the same accent. We've seen you with him. No, no, got wrong guy. Mm, leave me alone. I just want to sit here by the fire. And it says in the text, then a slave girl. This was a girl. Okay. No, I looking at Peter, and everyone's hearing. And it's a small court courtyard. It's probably about the size of this chapel. Everyone's hearing what's going on. They got Jesus up in the balcony, questioning him, ridiculing him. And Peter can eavesdrop on the conversation. And the girl says, no, I know you're with Jesus. Hey, this is one of them. And Peter says, blankety blank, I don't know the man. In the text it says he cursed. And was that a pivot moment for Peter? That moment. You know what? That's a bad moment for you. If you act like that and say, I don't know Jesus, I'm not interested, I'm not with him. We deny Christ even today in 2023, like Peter did that night, knowing him. We shouldn't do that. We should let people know, hey, I know Jesus, he saved me, he's the Lord, and he's coming back, and you need to know that. And also, they didn't believe the resurrection. Everybody was so surprised. The women were surprised, and Jesus told them, I will rise from the dead on the third day. It's like all of that went shooting by their head, and they didn't lock into their heart. The women didn't know it. The men didn't know it. Remember, now it says here that this angel said this to Mary Magdalene. And it says here in the text that she was the one that Jesus first appeared to, verse 9. She was the one whom Jesus cast out seven demons. And she went running back to Peter and John and said, you're not going to believe it. And they were hiding in a room in Jerusalem because the persecution was breaking out. Not only did Peter deny Christ, but now he's hiding from his calling, not doing the leadership he's called to. Mary Magdalene comes back. And everyone loved Mary Magdalene because of her testimony. I mean, if you get delivered from seven, seven demons, you got quite a testimony. And she goes running back and tells Peter and John, hey, the tomb was empty, stone rolled away, there was an angel there, said he'd risen, and he, he's alive, and, and he gave us a message to go ahead and tell you, Peter, and he actually mentioned you by name. <laughs> really, Peter goes. So Peter and John, they go hoofing it. Out of their locked room, down the stairs, through the streets, out the gate, past the hill called Golgotha, hill of the skull where Christ was crucified and his blood was still on the ground. Yeah. And then they go to the garden tomb that was just steps away, the scripture says. And they went in. And they were amazed. 
when I read the gospel accounts, I began to piece the story together because each gospel kind of gives a different angle of the story purposely. And in the story it says that when the Apostle John went in, it says he saw the linens lying there, and it says in the text, and he believed. Oh, John. The Apostle John. He was the youngest one. Talk about a young generation believing in Jesus. He was the youngest one. And he was known as the disciple that Jesus loved. Wow. I like to have that title. <laughs> disciple Jesus loved. I think he was Jesus' pet, maybe. I don't know. It, it mentions it in the gospel over and over again. And But it doesn't say that he said anything out loud. It's just he believed in his heart. And then Peter goes in, sees the empty tomb, and he walks out, and it says in the text, he was like scratching his head, and it says in the text, he wondered what had happened. Peter, bad moment after bad moment after bad moment. Not only was that a bad weekend for Jesus Christ, but that was a bad weekend for his key leader, Peter, who he called Peter Petros, rock, because upon this rock I will build my church. And right now, Peter's not looking too good. <laughs> Denies Christ, walks out of the empty tomb, wonders what in the world happened, and Jesus had said to him three times in the past 30 days, I will be crucified, I'll rise from the dead. It's both funny and heartbreaking. But, Here's why it's in the story. When you hear about the empty tomb and the stone rolled away and the angel speaking, saying he's not here, he's risen, when you hear the words of Jesus Christ, I will be put into the hands of evil men who will crucify me, but I'll rise on the third day. So now it's your turn. Are you going to believe that Christ died for you? Are you going to believe the words of Jesus when he said that he was going to go to the cross and die and raise from the dead? Are you going to believe the angel who was actually sitting in there? He's from the realm of God. He's from the throne. And he's saying he's not here. He's risen. Are you going to believe Mary Magdalene's testimony? She comes running back and says, he is, we heard he rose from the dead. That's why a preacher recounts these stories, these testimonies, for you 2,000 years later. Do you believe the story, what the angel said? Do you believe the empty tomb? Do you believe Mary Magdalene? Do you, mean, do you believe all the gospel writers who talk about the life and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Because if you say no, or you don't care, or you're going to walk out of here and go back to your sinful lifestyle, you're calling an awful lot of people liars, including Jesus. And I would encourage you to, this Easter Sunday, trust in Christ. You know, Mary Magdalene was uh, delivered from seven demons. Can you imagine? I mean, today and then, we all know, not being sarcastic, people are messed up. They're broken. They're scarred by a lot of things. By their past family, by past relationships, by their own undoing. We're just broken, marred, scarred people. And nobody be more messed up than Mary Magdalene. Mary from Magdalene. Seven demons. Can you imagine having seven demons in your mind and heart tormenting you? The darkness, the emptiness, the horribleness, the nightmare of that. So when she met Jesus and got healed, she was the most adoring, faithful disciple. She was the one that went to the tomb. She was the one that first preached the gospel. She was the one that believed it from the start. And so why is that important? You know what? You can't use your brokenness as an excuse for not believing in Jesus or committing your life to Him. I hear a lot of people say, well, I am so mad at my father, I'm so mad at my mother, I'm so mad at my siblings, I'm so mad at my boss, I, it was totally unfair, totally unjust, I'm so mad at God right now I could spit nails, because it was unfair what happened to me, and that's not right, and if there's a God in heaven, he wouldn't let that happen to me. 
I've heard this time and time again. Yeah, you know all this brokenness and pain and unfairness and injustice? You know where that's from? You. Yeah, that's right. You. That's what this says. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. At the very beginning of the story, page 3, it was Eve and Adam who ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, opening Pandora's box to disease, violence, injustice, and death. We opened that box, not God. He told us not to touch it, but oh, we touched it. <laughs> this entire story and the testimony of Jesus Christ is based on that account. You got a decision to make. You know, you're here on Easter. I may not see you again till next Easter. So I get these moments to try to speak the truth into your heart and life. And on this Easter, you need to recognize that the world's broken. You need to admit that you're broken. And you need to see that Jesus Christ is the Savior of mankind. Will not only forgive your sin, not only give you eternal life and conquer death, but he will mend your broken spirit. That's what this says. He mends broken people. That's what he does. I mean, his whole gospel story, every town he went into, mending the blind, mending the lame, mending the oppressed, the demon possessed, mending the broken. Ah, raising the dead. Remember that? Lazarus. About three weeks before he rode in there, he stopped by their house. He was good friends with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Lazarus had died. And Jesus rose him from the dead. And that account is in here. So, the reason I'm bringing it up is that you need to believe in the accounts of Mary. I believe Mary. I think someone who's delivered from seven evil spirits and went to the tomb and found it empty and, and then met Jesus later on and gave him a big hug. And Jesus appeared to people for over 40 days. I believe Mary. I heard about this young man, this angel who was sitting there giving an uh, announcement from the throne that this Jesus has risen from the dead as he said. I believe the angel. I believe Mary. I believe Mark who's writing this. I believe the words of Jesus that I just read from you when he said that I will be handed over into the hands of evil men, crucified and raised from the dead. I believe the story and it changed my life. So it's interesting that after the announcement and they ran out trembling, look at the response. The following verses talk about the responses. So we talked about the crucifixion and its purpose. We talked about the resurrection and its reason. We talked about the testimonies and the account written here. And with the few minutes I have remaining, look at the responses that these people had. Now, he had rose early, verse 9, on the first day of the week, and he appeared first to Mary Magdala, out of whom he had cast out a demon. So she went and told those who had been with him as they were mourning and weeping, this Peter, James, John, Philip, Matthew, Thomas. And when they heard, so she was running back to the room, when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, verse 10, no, verse 11, when they heard, they did not believe. Man, when I'm reading this, <laughs> Like, oh, guys, you're killing me. <laughs> Would Mary Magdalene, who was delivered and so devoted, come back and, and give you a bogus story? And Peter and the guys did not believe. And this is when they took off to look at the empty tomb. Let's, let's go on to verse 12. After that, he appeared in another form to two men as they were walking along the road in the country. This was the account of the Emmaus Road. And they went and told it to the rest. Who was the rest? The disciples hiding in the upper room. Peter, James, John, all the guys. Verse 13. But they did not believe them either. Okay. I am really disappointed with you guys. 
You're getting all these testimonies about an empty tomb, an angel, people who adore and love Jesus telling you, hey, not only tomb is empty, but we've seen him, we talked to him along the road, it was him, we're telling you, Peter. And it says, but they did not believe this account either. I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. And I tell you about my Bible reading and my study as I prepare. I'm in my study. I mean, Christine probably thinks I'm nuts. <laughs> One minute I'm laughing, the next minute I'm crying. Well, why would the writer Mark include these paragraphs and repeat that? Because that's how people are today. I'm up here preaching the best that I can through study and prayer, preaching my heart out. I mean this with every fiber of my being. And maybe you're going to walk out of here and not believe it either. I'm telling you, don't be lost. Jesus said, I've come to seek and save those who are lost. Don't be lost. I used to be lost. Pastor's kid. Met Jesus when I was 23 and realized I had it completely wrong. That's what you need to know if you don't know Jesus. You got it completely wrong. Hey, listen, I did the world, okay? Mm -hmm. Drugs, drinking, rock and roll, parties, bars, fast cars, in and out of prison, in and out of court. Did all that. I mean, if you're into that, let me tell you, dead end. <laughs> you know what that got me? A deep, dark, gloomy hole. Late one night, December 1985, walking out to my hot rod at midnight, thinking, you know what? Mm, I really don't want to be around anymore. This has gotten way too painful, confusing. I don't really have any real friends. Oh, they act like your friends when it's party time, but when the party goes away, see if they're your friends then. Mm, middle of the night. Didn't want to live anymore. And Jesus met me. Just like he went to meet Mary Magdalene. Messed up people who knew better. I knew better. I wanted to kind of put my testimony in there to let you know I'm not just some good preacher's kid who was goody goody nicey nicey and I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay? <laughs> I've been to the dark side of the moon. You don't want to go there. You want to step into the light like the Apostle John. Believe on him and walk in the light as he is in the light. And the grace of God will shine on you. I am out of time and I'll end with verse 14. So later, Jesus appears to the 11 knuckleheads up in the locked room in Jerusalem, verse 14. And what is Jesus going to say to these guys who kept saying, hey, I didn't believe them either. I don't believe what you're saying. It's too much to believe. Verse 14. Later, he, Jesus, appears to the 11. Bunch of knuckleheads. As they sat at the table. And listen to what he says. And he rebuked their unbelief and their hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Rebuked his boys, Peter, dude, you're supposed to be the rock, and you've been nothing but, you've been nothing at all like that. So Jesus shows up in the room and rebukes him for their hardness of heart. Why is that important? Well, that's for you to you can have a hardness of heart, a disbelief, not believe the testimony, not believe the gospel about Jesus Christ to save your soul and give you eternal life. You're going to take a pass on it. You're going to harden your heart. You're going to walk out and go back to your wretched life. I say to you, don't. Surrender to Jesus Christ. I'm going to give you a moment right now to do this as we close in prayer. Just uh, let your heart be a quiet place. And I'm going to give you a moment off of this message while you're stirred and thinking of it with the words of God in your head. Give you a chance to surrender your life to Jesus. Take him up on his offer. 
He died on the cross to forgive your sin. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ his Lord. He rose from the dead. That's why we get together. He conquered your sin, conquered death, so that you can be forgiven, have a restored relationship with God, and that when you die, it's not over for you. You'll go and step into the presence of the Lord. The scripture says, be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. If you know the Lord, and He knows you. And you'll have eternal life. And then when Christ returns, that fifth epic day I talked about, He will raise everyone from the dead. And that could be you. Let's just take a quiet moment, a quiet moment right now. And I just want to give you that opportunity to know Christ as your Savior. Ask Him to forgive you. Ask Him to give you eternal life. It's a free gift. It's the free gift of God. I want to give you an opportunity to do that now. Heavenly Father, for those who open their heart to you after your gospel message, I pray that you'll make yourself real to them. You'll give them new birth, new life. Open up their eyes, help them to see the truth of the Word of God, and give them a new life. And we take you up on this promise of eternal life. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Please stand for our final song. As we go out into the world, it says to carry joy in your heart. There's an old child's song that we used to sing in Sunday school. The joy, joy, joy that's deep in your heart. The reason we have that joy is because God is good and he is faithful. He's not only holy, he's also gracious and forgiving and faithful. And for that, we owe him all our praise. We, we owe him glory and honor. So please join us in singing, You Are Good.
great Easter Sunday. Thank you for attending. Thank <laughs> you.